Well, good morning. If you brought your Bible, and I hope you did, uh, go ahead and turn with me to the book of Ephesians chapter 6. If you're using one of the paperback Bibles that we have in the back, we're on page 636. It's such a joy to be together with the people that I love the most here at Redemption Hill, our church. It's been such a wonderful season walking through Ephesians these last several months, and um, it's kind of sad to be at the end of it. It's been a one, wonderful, wonderful time together. So we're in Ephesians chapter 6. This morning we're going to focus on verses 19 and 20. Please join me in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we come before you this morning with grateful hearts. We drove into church this morning. We saw a beautiful sun rising in the east. We get here, we get to greet friends and fellowship with people that we love. We get to come here this morning with many anxieties and feeling battered, fighting for joy in many ways. And, and we hear wonderful words shared this morning. God, thank you for the gift of prophetic words that seek to build up your church, that seek to encourage weary people. We thank you, God, for songs to sing, proclaiming to one another and to ourselves the gospel, the glory of our God. And now, Father, we get to turn to your word to hear from the living God your word to your people. So, Father, I pray that you would enable me to speak clearly and boldly as I ought and help us all to hear your words to our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, Ephesians chapter 6, we're going to focus on verses 19 and 20, but uh, this is really the kind of the, the close of this section of Ephesians. So let's start in verse 10 to put this in context. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints, and also for me, that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I, may be, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. Well, this morning we're going to talk about these last two verses. This morning we're going to talk about the gospel and evangelism. We're going to talk about this climax of this section on the armor of God, for which Paul now solicits prayer for himself to proclaim the gospel boldly as he ought to speak, he says. So we're going to talk about proclaiming our faith to the lost around us. We're going to learn from Paul's example and see what God, how the promises that God gave to Paul are the same for us. Well, few things humble a person more than asking them to tell you about their prayer life. And the same could be said if you ask, the per if you ask somebody to tell you about their habit of sharing the gospel with the lost. Few things humble us. There's usually a shuffling of the feet, a downward gaze, and an awkward fear, maybe even this morning, that we're going to force some program of evangelism upon you against your will. I remember in Bible college, I used to show up to chapel each week, and every now and then it seemed at random, 
whoever was supposed to speak that morning would say would announce to the to the whole school, "Good news! This morning we're going to go out and we're going to share the gospel with the people on the streets of Dallas." And everybody <laughs> awkwardly kind of shuffles and is there any way I can sneak out without anybody noticing that I'm not part of the pack here? <laughs> is a terrible place to be. But that's where we are. We are. The truth is that we feel weak in this area. Almost every Christian that I know feels weak in the area of evangelism. Everyone feels plagued by weakness in there. Did you know that every zealous Christian in this room, as you look around this room, every zealous Christian in this room, nobody feels content with his effectiveness in this area. We feel guilty for our timidity. We feel regret for our missed opportunities. We feel like phonies because of our lack of compassion for the lost. Well, if it helps at all, I feel that way too. I'm right there with you. This message, this message is not easy for me to preach because I'm aware of my own weakness. I'm aware of my own timidity. I'm aware of my own fears and past failures in this area of evangelism. And so I'm preaching this message first and foremost to myself. These words I'm speaking this morning are not spoken from a man who is looking at you with correction and condemnation, but of sympathy and personal conviction. I need this word from God. And so I want to share with you this morning, not conviction, not condemnation, but a prayer, a longing, a vision of what we as the people of God are called to and what we can be and what we can do by the grace of God, by the empowering of the Holy Spirit, I pray that God would help us as his people to be changed by his word, by this message, to become more fruitful in God's hands. That confusion about this area would turn to conviction, that fear would turn into faith, that shame would turn into joy. I pray that we as a church would be freed from the paralyzing effects of guilt in regard to personal evangelism, that all of us would find some natural outlet of love to the people all around us in our city, in our neighborhoods, in our workplaces, in our family members, that our personal sense of the reality of Christ would be so deep and confident and satisfying that we simply cannot refrain from speaking of our Savior, from proclaiming the gospel to those all around us, and that the power of Christ would rest upon us with unusual effectiveness. That's my prayer this morning. That's my hope. That's my longing. That's the vision that I'm praying that we all walk out of here with, that we all walk out of here not with this kind of, oh gosh, Aaron's going to ask me about evangelism, but a joy, a hope, a faith, a confidence in the message that we proclaim and the spirit that empowers us. My main point this morning, as I read this text, as we learn from Paul's example, is that the spirit who called Paul, an empowered Paul for evangelism, calls us and empowers us for evangelism. The same spirit that was at work in him is at work in us. When God saves us, he simultaneously calls us to join in his mission. He calls us as ambassadors, as Paul calls himself here, an ambassador in chains. He calls us as ambassadors to proclaim the gospel to others, but he doesn't just call us that. He doesn't just command us to do something. He he empowers us. He enables what he commands. And that's good news for us this morning. Because left to ourselves, we are timid, we are weak, we are unable to do this work. So a little context for the sermon is in order. For the last several months, as we've been working through this wonderful letter of Paul to the Ephesian church, we've learned a ton along the way about who God is and what he's done and the life that he calls us to live. And over the last couple weeks, we've studied this section Paul's done, uh, John's done a wonderful job of, of communicating the heart behind this passage of the whole armor of God. It's an exciting passage. Uh, if you missed the last couple weeks, please go online, find those messages. It's worth your time. It's good for your soul. And all the language of this section that we just read, all the language, it all screams action, right? It's not just, you know, kind of take this and, and rest in it, but it's, it's take this and, and prepare for war. It's a call to warfare. It's a call to action. Swords, helmets, shields, shoes. Paul starts off this letter proclaiming a gospel of peace, and he ends getting us ready for war. It's kind of a, a puzzling way to put this th- together. 
So Paul calls us to action. And I want to remind you for a moment of where Paul is. You remember the, the place that Paul is at right now? You remember where he is? He's in prison. He says he's an ambassador in chains because he's literally in chains. He's literally chained to a wall. He's hungry. He's hurting. He's alone. And when he comes to this end, this section here where he's asking the church to pray for him, naturally we expect him to say, now pray that I would be released from prison. Pray that I'd be able to get out so that I can get on about my work. But he doesn't pray that. He doesn't pray for a change of his circumstances. I mean, if anybody has an excuse not to proclaim the gospel, it's when you're sitting in prison for proclaiming the gospel. You think, okay, man, chill out, calm down, be wise. That's what I'd tell somebody. If I found out that a brother of mine you know, in, in another country was in prison for proclaiming the gospel, I'd say, okay, okay, now the wise thing to do here is to, is to be quiet, to play along, because you'll be more fruitful when you get out, but not so with Paul. Paul doesn't pray for a change of circumstances. He was never concerned with his own life or his own comfort primarily. Paul was always thinking of others. So he wasn't praying a personal request in that sense. He was interested in one thing primarily. What's that? The proclamation of the gospel, even when he's in chains, even where he is. It even lends more credibility to the message that he proclaims. The proclamation of the gospel, the mystery of the gospel that he has unfolded in the third chapter of this letter. The glorious mystery of the gospel of Christ, the unsearchable riches of of Christ. This is what he was concerned with. This is what he asked the church to pray for. The proclamation of the gospel and the advance of God's kingdom. God, Paul asked not for release from prison, but for power to proclaim. And that's the example that we want to learn from here in this. This should humble us because how many of our prayers are driven by a desire for a change of our circumstances? How many of our prayers are driven by uh, I, I need a release from this suffering. I need a release from you know, the anxieties that I'm, that I'm encountering. These prayers are not wrong. It's good to bring those. The, the Bible calls us to bring our anxieties before the Lord. The Bible declares that we should seek an end of our suffering. We should look to the Lord as our comforter, as our healer, as our hope in the midst of trials. So it's good to pray those prayers. But the heart that Paul has is for boldness in personal evangelism. This should humble us, but it should also compel us. We never want to, we never want to lose sight. Wherever we are in life, it's always easy to lose sight of the mission. It's always easy to get caught up in our circumstances and think about the season that we're in, to think about how busy we are or whatever troubles we're walking through, and to justify that for taking our eyes off of the mission that God calls us to but we never want to lose sight of that. Paul didn't want to lose sight of that while he was sitting in prison. Paul not only wanted power for himself, but he wanted to stir up a passion for proclamation among the church. Paul's desire was to demonstrate that personal evangelism is expected of all Christians at all times and all circumstances, including those in prison, including those who have the greatest excuses not to do it. Who am I going to share with? I'm sitting chained to a wall but not so with Paul. But Paul does more than this. He doesn't just give us this, this high example and call us to do it, but he also shows that his confidence was not in his own gifts or his own ability. This is the man who has written a great portion of the New Testament. He's written a great portion of the Bible, the Word of God. If any man had great confidence for his own ability, it was Paul, and yet he doesn't. He's praying for help. He's praying for boldness. He's praying for words to be given him in opening his mouth. He's not saying that because he's not clear on the gospel. He's just unfolded the gospel. He's just explained the gospel. He's, he's treasuring and exulting in the gospel. So he knows the words, but he knows that in those moments, he needs help. He's to, he knows what it is to be timid. He knows what it is to be fearful. And so that gives us hope this morning. So this morning, I want to share with you three truths concerning personal evangelism that will help us move from, confu from confusion to conviction, from fear to faith, and from shame to joy. The first thing that we learn from Paul's example is that he sees ex gospel expansion as the responsibility of all Christians everywhere. 
A Christian who keeps his faith private is completely foreign to Paul. He sees it as his responsibility, and he sees it as our responsibility. Now, nobody in this room right now I know is having a light bulb come on. Oh, I'm supposed to share the gospel. I know that the call to evangelize is not new to anyone in this room. But we, even though we know that it's true, we often fail in this for a variety of reasons. I've already detailed some of them. There's no shortage of reasons that we give ourselves to justify why we don't do what we know we're called to do. So there's a number of reasons that we don't evangelize. We can talk a lot about that. I'm going to share three reasons that we don't that I struggle with for doing evangelism. The first one is it's intimidating. Fear of man. I'm afraid of what people are going to think of me when I share the gospel. I'm more aware, I'm more fearful of what people think of me when I share the gospel than I am concerned for their own soul. I'm more fearful of what man thinks of me than what God thinks of me in that moment. Secondly, I'm too busy. I am, come on, I'm a young husband. Maybe not as young as I used to be or some of you in this room. I still think of myself as a young husband and a young father. I certainly have young children. I have four of them. I have two jobs. I pastor a number of people. I, I pastor a church that I seek to disciple and to care for and to counsel. I have a business with employees to oversee customers to acquire and to keep happy. I have friends that I do life with. I have hobbies that I, I enjoy. I have family members in other cities to keep up with. So I'm, I live a busy life. So that, I, I don't have time for evangelism. When am I going to go out and do evangelism? I want to share a story with you that will that, that convicts me in this area. I want to tell you a story about a friend of mine named Jennifer Howes. Jennifer Howes, about 15 years ago, she and her husband, Jonathan, were, were starting a new church, like we're doing here. And they were in a young, they were young, newly married. They had two small children, two years old and six months old. And because of their conviction, because of their compassion for the city, their, their desire to see the lost saved, like we have the desire to see the lost saved. That's why we came here, started a church. That's why we gathered together is to equip the saints and to do the work of ministry. Acting on that desire, Jennifer and Jonathan went out separately to share the gospel. And so they would literally go through the city and just look for opportunities, pray, praying, Lord, where can I spend my day today? Looking for opportunities to share the gospel. And so what Jennifer was doing, she had a stroller with her six-month-old baby. She was going door to door near a campus in Arlington, Texas, UTA. So they were going door to door at UTA. Uh, and she found herself on a sorority house uh, row. So she was going door to door to these sorority houses, knocking on the doors and just asking, you know, can I talk to you about a church that we're starting? Can I talk to you about what we're doing here? And she came upon one house and a 20 year old girl answered the door. And Jennifer asked this, can I share with you? about this church that we're starting. So this you know, girl said, yeah, sure, go for it. And so she starts to share that. And she, uh, she says, you know, can I come in and sit down with you? And it, I see that you've got some other sorority sisters here. Can I sit down and share something with y'all? So they said, yeah, sure, they're, they're friendly people. So she walks in, she sits down on the couch and she starts to share the gospel. Well, in Arlington, Texas, you're in you know, what's known as the buckle of the Bible Belt, right? The Dallas area is right there in the middle of the Bible Belt. Everybody's a Christian. Everybody's connected to a church somehow. And so all the girls are familiar with the gospel. None of them are saying, wait a second, what's his name, Jesus? But Jennifer continued to share because she's sitting here and she's, she's discerning. I know that not all of these young ladies know this gospel and know this Jesus the way that I do. And so she continued to share and they're shaking their heads. And you know she didn't have any kind of climactic finish where the ladies are all saying, what must I do to be saved? But what she wasn't aware is that that young lady who opened the door and another lady, uh, another young woman, were both inwardly becoming convicted of their sin. And Jennifer left. And Jennifer left not knowing if anything happened. So she wasn't aware of, did this bear any fruits at all? And that's really important because that's how so much of evangelism is. So much of it is sowing seeds, unaware of what fruit's going to flow. But what happened is that these two young ladies were both converted. And then five other young women in this sorority ended up becoming converted in the, in the weeks to come. Seven young women were converted to the gospel of Jesus Christ because of the faith 
of one young mother pushing her six-month-old child. Imagine that weakness. I mean, this isn't, you know, Ravi Zacharias or whatever, you know, Billy Graham, whatever great evangelist comes to mind that you think of is that's his job for evangelism. It was a young mom in a very busy season of life with a lot going on with a six-month-old child who needed to get home for a nap. And this is what happened. And then more than that, the young woman who opened the door ended up a couple of years later becoming part of an evangelistic Bible study to reach others with the gospel. And a young man came into that Bible study and it ended up being converted as well. And that young man was me. And that young lady was my wife. And we've now been married for 13 years. And now we're raising four young sons to know our Savior that we came to know. So when you think about the fearful prospect of going out in a busy season and you, you justify, I, I can't do it. What am I going to say? I've got this baby. They're not even going to be listening to me. They're thinking about other things, whatever it is. Don't discount the power of the Lord to work in those moments. And don't discount, you know, when you walk away from a moment of sharing the gospel, what the Lord will do. You can walk away from a meeting unaware. Jennifer was not aware that Holly was converted in that moment, but she was. So was Julie and so were five other ladies and then that led to me being converted and several others, uh, many others. I don't even know all the fruit that came from that moment. So I'm too busy. So is Jennifer. And look at what the Lord did. Another reason that we don't take seriously our, our call to personal evangelism is that we believe it's somebody else's job. We think of evangelists. We think that there are people who have the gift of evangelism. And, and it's true that there is the gift of, some people are gifted to be evangelists, which is primarily an equipping gift. But just like not all have the gift of mercy, but all are called to be merciful, not all are gifted with the gift of hospitality, but all are called to show hospitality, all are called to do evangelism. Consider the following words from Jesus himself regarding our role. I'm gonna go through a number of scriptures here. I want you to consider this is the word of God. These are the words of our Savior to his disciples. That's you and me. Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20, a very familiar text. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And behold, don't miss this promise, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Mark 16, 15. And he said to them, go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. Luke 24, verses 46 and 47, thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead and that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed to his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. John chapter 20, verse 21, Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. Acts 1.8. Oh, this is an exciting one. Acts 1.8. But you will receive power. He doesn't just send them out. He says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be witnesses. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. These are the words of Jesus to his disciples. And if you, if, you want to, if you want to discount that because it was the apostles, because it was his original disciples, they weren't, they weren't given to the apostles only. Think about this. Who shared the gospel with you? It wasn't one of the apostles, right? It wasn't Peter. It wasn't Paul. The, the apostles never came to this country. They won't come to your neighborhood or to the place that you work. For the great commission to be fulfilled there, for Christ to have a witness in that remote part of the earth, in Round Rock, Texas, in Hutto, in Georgetown, in Cedar Park, in Austin. For Christ to have a witness there, a Christian just like you must have the conviction that it's our responsibility. There's not one verse in the Bible, listen, there's not one verse in the Bible, no instance in the Bible where someone receives the gospel and is converted apart from a person who shares the gospel, who had the boldness and the conviction to share it with them. No one is converted in the Bible apart from a human agent. And that's the same today. Where do you feel, as you think about these objections that I have, as you think about, well, I'm too busy or I'm too fearful or it's somebody else's job, where do, where do you feel weak? 
where do you feel the Lord calling you to express faith and to take a small step of faith in your life? Where do you feel Paul was chained to a wall? Where do you feel chained and hindered in this call to share the gospel? Where do you see the power of shame keeping you from joyful proclamation? The power of shame is an overlooked area that hinders the work of ministry. We're going to talk a little bit later about the warfare of evangelism. But real quickly, I just want to draw attention to the spiritual attacks that come by the power of shame. Often, so often, we want to, we see a need for, to share the gospel. We see an opportunity to share the gospel, but we're aware, you know what? I haven't even read my Bible in the last week. Or I've, I've been struggling with this, and who am I? Who am I to share the gospel? Who am I to speak words of faith and hope to this other person? I'm a, I'm a bigger mess than they are. Shame comes in and plagues us and hinders us. It paralyzes us from sharing the gospel. And Satan delights in that. Satan loves to say, you shouldn't do that. I know who you are. You know who you are. You have no business speaking about the good news of Jesus Christ because you're not even experiencing that. And that's where we can say, yes, you're right. That is true. I am not worthy. But the gospel is true. The gospel speaks a better word than that. The gospel says that in Christ, I am counted righteous. I am forgiven of my sins. No one, not Billy Graham or Ravi Zacharias or John Piper or any of your favorite evangelists or theologians are worthy on their own to share the gospel. Nobody reads their Bible enough or lives a life that's perfect enough to do it. Nobody except one. And that one commissions us to do his work. That one commissions us to speak of the greatest joy and the greatest news that we've ever heard. That one sends his spirit to fill us, which we want to talk about more in just a moment. So we we must pray that God will grant us conviction that for the lost in our lives to be saved, he will use our small steps of faith. And this this is simply just not an area that we can afford to be confused on or fuzzy on because, this, because the devil delights in us being fuzzy in this area. And the, light, the devil delights in us lacking conviction in this area because the devil does not delight in evangelism. The devil does not delight in, his, in Christians taking their faith and sharing it with others and spreading the good news. So let's pray for that conviction. Let's ask God to open our eyes to see the plight of our lost neighbors and family members and plead for their salvation and plead for opportunities to share the gospel with them. Listen to what Charles Spurgeon says about this. Such a good quote. The Holy Spirit will move them first, will move them by first moving you. If you can rest without them being saved, they will rest too. But if you are filled with an agony for them, if you cannot bear that they should be lost, you will soon find that they are uneasy too. I hope that you will get into such a state that you will dream about your child or your neighbor perishing for lack of Christ and start up at once and begin to cry, oh God, give me converts where I die. Then, then, then you will have converts. When you are moved with compassion, when you are burdened for your neighbors. They will feel that too. So who are those in your life? Who are those in your life that God has placed you in right now? Think about the circles. Some of you were around for that evangelism seminar that we had uh, where Rob Tumbrell came in and, and he talked about these different circles of influence. And we talked about circles of you know, like your neighborhood and your workplace and your friends and hobbies, common interests, uh, or places that you frequent. So maybe you have a favorite uh, coffee shop or a favorite restaurant that you go to, and you see the same people over and over. Think about the people in your life and where God might call you to exert your influence to speak of the hope that you have to share the gospel. Who are those that you believe that God might call you to take a small step of faith, to start with praying for them, to start by asking God to give you a heart for them, to start considering the plight that they truly are in and to be bothered by that? And when you're bothered, they're going to be bothered. And when you have hope and faith for their change, they're going to have hope and faith for their change. When you can see that in them, when you believe in the power of Christ to change their lives, they will have that hope and that faith as well. 
So where is God calling you to cast off your chains and take steps of faith? I read an article yesterday by David Mathis, who's with, um, he's um, the assistant to a pastor named John Piper. He wrote this wonderful article on hospitality as evangelism. You know, many of us have lives that are busy, and, you know, we have a lot of moms in this church that are at home with their kids all day long, um, and you're busy, and you can't imagine when am I going to get out, what circles. I don't frequent any restaurants. I can't remember the last time I was at a restaurant. Uh, I don't go to coffee shops or whatever it is. Think about your home as the mission field. You can invite others into your home. Invite them in. Let them experience the work of the Holy Spirit in your life, in your, in your family. The God... Gu- <coughs> Increasingly, David writes, the most strategic turf on which to engage unbelievers is the turf of our own homes. You may not be able to go out, you know, the the thought of pushing a stroller and knocking on doors of sorority homes or your neighbors may be intimidating, but you can certainly invite someone to dinner. You can have somebody over for a backyard barbecue. That's kind of easy. That's not as intimidating. You can do that and you can invite somebody else from church, invite them into that context and let them participate in the work of the Spirit in community and pray for God to work. Make no mistake, while God does gift some from ministry as evangelists, he calls all Christians everywhere to be his witnesses. That's you and me in the midst of our busyness, in the midst of fearful, fearful circumstances, in the midst of our, of our joyless, of our fight for joy privately. Right there, God calls us to be witnesses. So let's pray together and cultivate the conviction that personal evangelism is both our joy and our responsibility. Second point, evangelism is empowered. You see Paul praying here for boldness, praying for words to be given to him, praying for boldness to speak the word boldly as he ought to speak. One of the first snags in evangelism, this is, a friend, this is from a friend of mine named Jim Donahue. He says, one of the first snags in evangelism is not clearly understanding just what we're called to do. Jim says, we often assume that we need to step into a phone booth and fly out with our super evangelist cape on, debating like a speeding bullet, confronting more powerfully than a locomotive, and converting in a single bound. That's the evangelist. That's what we're called to, right? And that terrifies every one of us. But this is simply not the case. Paul himself doesn't simply rush out proclaiming. First, he recognizes his need for help. First, he recognizes his dependence on God to enable him, to empower him for the task at hand. Pray for me, Paul says, that I may be given words to speak and boldness to proclaim. Paul himself tells us in a number of places that he is not just a naturally eloquent speaker. He regularly asks for prayer in this regard. We often justify our lack of evangelism because it's not our gift. Well, it wasn't Paul's gift either. Paul didn't say, I'm a gifted evangelist. We think, we think of these people. John's referenced me historically as, as an example in this area, but I'm, I do not feel gifted as an evangelist. I told you, you know, I mentioned earlier all these fears. Every single time that I get up to share the gospel, every time that I get up the nerve to greet somebody else at the, at the coffee shop or to engage one of my coworkers, I would draw them out about their lives. Every time that I seek to apply the gospel in that moment, I'm, I'm, a, I'm afraid every one of those times I'm inwardly praying, God, help me to be bold. God, help me, give me words, give me strength. Every single time. Paul was not, a, was not gifted in evangelism. You may not feel gifted in evangelism. And yet Paul saw it as his responsibility. Paul models for us not just a life of of obeying that responsibility, but of dependence on God for power. His personal proclamation was not something that he was uniquely gifted to do, but it's something that the Spirit of God empowers us to do. Consider what happened in Acts 4 when the church prayed for help in evangelism. When the church gathers together, it says in Acts 4, 31, that when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. Attempting to do evangelism without the Spirit of God is like trying to fly a kite with no wind. It doesn't work. None of us are able on our own. We serve a God, however, who empowers us with the Spirit gladly. We see this illustrated in the life of Paul. We see it in, in Acts. 
we see it happen today as well. And therefore, our call, first and foremost, is to, we want to pray for conviction, and we want to pray for power. We want to pray for God to fill us with his Holy Spirit, and then look for opportunities to walk in the Spirit and to share our faith. Praying God this way not only expresses our complete dependence on God in prayer, but it also appropriately recognizes God's sovereignty in conversion. Our job is to sow seeds. His job is to convert. Our job is to speak words of truth. His job is to work in hearts. The power of evangelism comes from God through the Holy Spirit. From the instant from the instant that we're converted, we're filled with the Holy Spirit. From the instant that we're converted, we're gifted to speak uh, for evangelism. Think about the blind beggar who was healed and immediately went out proclaiming about the man who healed him. That's us. That's you and me. We may not feel gifted because we think, gosh, I'm such a, uh, I'm so unaware and ignorant of proper theology. I can't, I can't spell the doctrine of justification to save my life. I don't know what the Westminster Confession of Faith is. I don't know what these different theological terms are. But you can speak about the work of God in your own life. You can speak about how God changed. You can speak about the hope that you have because you do have a hope. And you can share that simply. God doesn't need the most eloquent speakers. In fact, I think God most often uses the simple among us. Think about who Jesus called. He did not call eloquent speakers. He did not call the learned and the wise. He called fishermen. He called people who worked at the docks and said, I want you to be my witnesses. So if he can call the people who worked at the docks and fill them with the spirit, he can gift us to speak as well. The same spirit that changed your life is the spirit who empowers you for proclamation. Listen to what Donald Whitney, Donald Whitney wrote a book on the spiritual disciplines of the Christian life, and he says this, about evangelism, which he calls a a discipline to cultivate. He says, if God by his spirit has transformed you into a follower of Jesus, be confident of this. God has given you Acts 1-8 power. This means that in ways and methods compatible with your personality, your spiritual gifts, opportunities, and so on, you do have the power to share the gospel with people. Having Acts 1-8 power also means that God will empower your life and your words in the sharing of the gospel in ways that you will often not even perceive. Think back to Jennifer. She didn't perceive what God was doing in that room, and yet seven people were converted as a result of that visit. And then more people were converted afterwards. God will empower your life and your words in the same way. You will sow a seed at the coffee shop. You'll, you'll, as a young mom, just, just talk about your own weakness and your own struggle, your own need for God in your life, and that affects somebody else. And they say, you know what? There's something about that. As that person, they weren't putting on a front, they weren't showing how awesome and and how amazing life is. That's not our call. Our call is not to show that once you become a Christian, that all your problems in life go away. Often they, they multiply. But our job is to speak of the hope that we have in the midst of those troubles. God works in mysterious ways. And remember that, we, we must remember that success in evangelism is not measured in converts. Success in evangelism, certainly we want to pray for converts. We want to pray for conversions. But remember, remember that Jesus himself shared the gospel with many people who did not follow him. Think about the rich young rulers. Jesus spent time with the rich young ruler himself. Personally, the Lord of life, the God of creation who created this man, shared the gospel with this man and did not see him immediately converted. And we wouldn't call Jesus a failure. So we mustn't use conversion as the mark of success in evangelism for us either. Rather, successful evangelism is doing evangelism. Sharing the gospel itself, that's what the Lord calls us to. And the great hope that we have in sharing the gospel is not our words, not our ability to communicate, not because we know the perfect illustration to draw on the back of a napkin. It's good to do those things. It's good to have gospel tracts. It's good to equip yourself, to prepare yourself for the work of evangelism. But the, the hope that we have in doing evangelism is in the message itself. God embeds the gospel itself with power. Romans 1.16, Paul boldly declares that he is not ashamed of the gospel for it The gospel itself is the power of God for salvation for everyone who believes. You don't need the power of coercion or the right answers for every question because the power of salvation does not rest in you but in the gospel itself. 
How is the gospel the power that saves? Because the gospel proclaims God's powerful saving commitment to those who respond in faith. The gospel is power, powerful because it's effectual. It's effectual because it's the true word about the world that we live in. The power of God. God has this. He's got this. Our, jo- our job is to be in on it. We get to do this. It's a joy. And God's provided a, a multitude of gospel metaphors throughout the pages of his word that beckon sinners into adoption in his family. This is why people can be converted through the sophisticated presentations of PhDs who study apologetics and evangelism. But they can also be converted by a book by C.S. Lewis that you gave them. They can be converted by a gospel tract. They can be converted by the articulation of a young child who shares his hope and his love for Jesus. It's the gospel itself that God blesses like no other words. One way to partner with the Spirit is we seek the Spirit's empowering for boldness to speak as we ought, as we speak, as we seek for words, we want to prepare ourselves. One way that we can prepare, that we can partner with the Spirit is by prayer. Another way is by preparation. We can, we can seek resources. We can acquaint ourselves with the Word of God. We can, we can spend time with this day in and day out, learning the words of Scripture. We can meditate on the gospel and how it's good news for me. Before it's good news for anybody else, it's got to be good news for you. How is the gospel good news for you? How is God working in your life? You can prepare by, by reading books on evangelism or, or by grabbing resources off our resource table. If you're not aware, there's a table out here that we have loaded with resources. Stan and Judy Boulay uh, oversee this table, and a number of people work on it, and they put out uh, little gospel tracts like this. Some of you don't like using gospel tracts. That's okay. For those of you who do, grab a stack of these. They're free. We'd love for you to take them all. I would love for that table to be ransacked after the service today. Grab a stack. What's easier than than to hand somebody a car that invites them to church where they're going to be confronted with those who, you know, maybe I'm introverted. Well, I can hand them a card and and introduce them to my extroverted friend, John. John's going to share the gospel. I can get them there. I can put them in his way. Right, we can, we can take these little how good are you tracks, which walks you through. You want to know how to do a gospel presentation? Grab this and just, and just ask somebody, can I go through this with you? On a scale of one to 10, how do you rate yourself? They always say six or seven. That's funny. Everybody says six or seven, and you just kind of walk through that. We've got lots of resources, these three and lots more that are on that table. Equip yourself, prepare. You know, if you want to do evangelism, you should put yourself in a position to do evangelism. Grab some of these resources that will, that will help you and pray for the Spirit to empower you. And that's the promise that we have from Paul, is that the Spirit who empowered him for evangelism empowers us for evangelism. Think about that. Think about the influence and the effect that you can have by partnering with the Spirit of God. Finally, evangelism is war. You think back to these, to these verses. You think back to what it says in Ephesians 6, 12, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers and authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Paul calls us to war. He calls us to gird ourselves for war. He says, we've got a mission to engage in. We have a war to involve ourselves in. Evangelism is war. We are going to battle with Satan and his army. We are seeking to win souls for God's kingdom. We are seeking the advance of the gospel in this world. It's war. Paul describes the Christian life this way because he knows how easy it is to just get lost thinking about life here and now. How many of us just, how many of us right now, and I'm, I'm with you, are thinking more about where we'll be vacationing next year or the new home that we're purchasing? It's so easy to neglect thinking about eternity to think about our neighbors and wondering where they are. Not so for Paul. For Paul, he was aware that heaven and hell are realities that one day every soul will end up in one or the other. Neglecting this, neglecting to consider this truth can totally squelch our zeal for evangelism. It encourages us to focus on this brief life. I read a friend of mine sent me an email a few days ago 
quoting uh, the screw tape letters and talking about how the devil's warfare was to keep people focused mostly on politics. He said, you focus them on politics because when you're mostly focused on politics, you're not thinking about the souls of your neighbors. Politics are good. I'm not saying don't focus on politics, but a mere and a primary occupation thinking about this brief life hinders us from the work of God in this world. So we want to consider that. And when we take steps of faithfulness in this warfare to share the gospel with others, the devil is not going to take it kindly. He's a roaring lion, First Peter says, who seeks to devour. He's an evil parent who would keep the sons of disobedience locked away in cellars of sin and shame and unbelief. Evangelism is war. It's boldly encroaching on the enemy's territory, arousing that lion. And we should, we should anticipate his fierce response. Satan will discourage you in your efforts, distract you in your prayers, and even harass you with seasons of suffering. When you take steps of faithfulness, anticipate this, know this, prepare for this. It's war. But this shouldn't cause us fear. It should awaken us to the reality about us. It should stir our hearts to more action. It should move us with compassion to speak all the more boldly for the sake of the souls all around us. Few people help me understand evangelism as warfare as effectively as Charles Spurgeon. Listen to what he says here. This heart that I want to cultivate, this reality that we want to be aware of. He says, if sinners will be damned, at least let them leap to hell over our bodies. And if they will perish, let them perish with our arms about their knees, imploring them to stay. If hell must be filled, at least let it be filled in the teeth of our exertions and let no one go there unwarned and unprayed for. Paul was aware that evangelism is warfare. Paul was aware of the realities of heaven and hell. Paul was aware of the power of the gospel to save, and Paul longed to see his people saved. We want to long to see those in Round Rock and in Austin and in this, this area. We want to long to see our family members saved. We want to have this heart. If they're going there, at least let them do it aware of our tears and aware of our agony for them. So evangelism is warfare. Satan will attack us in the midst of this. He will seek to dissuade us. But let us not fear our ancient foe. The gospel of Jesus Christ is a peacemaking word and infinitely greater than the little roar of the lion. One little word shall fell him. His defeat is as sure as the cross is true. Christ has risen in triumph over sin and death and evil to make all things new. That's you and me, everyone who trusts in his name. His saving power is on full display for the heavenly rulers and authorities where God shows off his power and shames the devil. This means, this means that our personal evangelism is not ultimately about our converts, our methods, our disciples, our community, even our church or ministry. Personal evangelism, there's a greater story unfolding here. There's a greater reality on display. The gospel is on display through the church to shame the evil powers to stun the angels until one great day, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And that will give God all the glory. Gospel proclamation is warfare. Gospel proclamation is obedience. Gospel proclamation is also worship. And until that day where every knee shall bow, we should dress for battle and do evangelism as eternal war. Listen, my prayer and longing, as I mentioned at the outset, is, is not to condemn anyone, not for anyone to leave, you know, oh gosh, please don't let Aaron ask me next week who I've shared the gospel with, and I might. <laughs> but that God would use this message to stoke faith in every one of us to take steps of faith to take steps of obedience, to pray for evangelistic opportunities, to pray for God to show us who in our circles, in our spheres of work and family and life, he would call us to take small steps of faith in tomorrow, today, this week, next month, this, this coming year. This is an area, this area of personal evangelism, of outreach, 
of seeking the advance of the gospel is an area that we feel strongly about, that we want to spend significant time in the next year focusing on and praying for God to move in our midst. We, we have a baptism coming up in a few weeks, as you heard, and we want to see lots of baptisms coming in the next year, not so that we can boast of how many people are being added to our church, but that we can rejoice with the souls who are being purchased for heaven, who are being snatched out of the fire of hell, that we can rejoice at the work of God granting new life to those who are currently dead. So would you join me in that prayer? Would you join me in praying for God to move in our hearts that he's gonna use you and me in our busy lives, in our seasons where we are fighting for joy ourselves, in our seasons of busyness, our, our personal place of timidity and fear, and surely God can't use me. I'm not worthy, whatever it is. Pray for God to grant you opportunities to place you in moments where you can share the gospel. Grab some resources on your way out today. Grab a stack of invites, grab a book to give away, and look for opportunities to do that this week. Dependent on the Spirit of God to empower us for this task. Please join me in prayer. Father of God, we thank you for this book of Ephesians. We thank you for the pages of Scripture that that teach us, that equip us, that encourage us. We thank you, God, for the great hope that we have of the gospel. I thank you, God, for saving me. I thank you, Father, for Jennifer Howes taking a step of faith, going out with her six-month-old child and sharing the gospel with Holly and her friends so many years ago and for the faith that Holly and other friends had to have this Bible study that led to me being converted. I thank you, God, for all the people who sowed seeds in my life over the years that led me to being saved, and for all those who were completely unaware of the fruit that came from those moments. God, I pray for every person in here to be aware that they are the most effective missionary to the people that they live with and work with and play with. God, you've equipped every one of us by filling us with your spirit, empowering us to speak boldly with Paul. I pray that you'd help us to speak boldly. I pray that you'd help us to speak with words of joy and hope and life. And Father, we pray that you would bless our meager efforts. We love you, Father. We thank you, God, for the gospel. We thank you for the hope of Jesus. We pray this in his precious and great, majestic name.